just paid your stuff last night. You ready? All right, we're live. So uh, today's um, episode will focus on the bubble boy. Where would the group like to start? Kenny, what's going on here? I think you might have a cluster group or small group disorder, but I think it was kind of hard to determine that because he was only interacting with Jerry. Um, there was something maybe along the lines of narcissistic or borderline, but I didn't really see enough evidence to say that just because um, the one thing that was very evident was kind of like this like almost manipulative behavior. Um, like maybe the suit, now you have to do this for me, and then not having this like self-awareness for um like the social cues that Jerry was having or why Jerry was so like not understanding why Jerry was so upset. So I don't know how those two this, this is this is the goal. I don't know if that's uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like this candy. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. I and off the top of my head, I, I can't think of the episode. Yeah, Banyan, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it the soup? Yes, and he's just saying, like, he wants, he's like, oh, Neil, the soup doesn't want to be Neil. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I think we might be looking at the wrong. I mean, listen, so, sometimes people come in and uh, in our psychotherapy notes, we sometimes get the wrong sessions uh, documented. So um, we'll stick to the bubble boy. Uh, thoughts? You can always talk about training when it's really just cigar. I mean, it, I feel like this episode is like latest obsessions with uh, like cigars, and then obviously, like inadvertently, he ends up leaving the in the cabin, and the whole cabin ends up burning down. But also, his response to it at the end was pretty inappropriate because instead of being like, "Oh, the cabin, I'm so sorry," he's like, "My cigar," then tries to run back into like a burning building. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we said before maybe schizotypal features, but I don't even know to kind of make of this preoccupation right yeah, yeah. No, and i agree with you um this looks like to be a schizotypal personality disorder you know uh, i think that there are some episodes where while there is eccentricity um we don't see the illusions and we don't see the other things that tend to define schizotypal and he looks like he's on that spectrum where it might be more of a schizoid personality or schizoid personality traits uh, but in either case, what we're doing is discussing the cluster A personality disorder. So interestingly, we switch from Banyan uh, in, I think, perhaps the soup. It was the soup. Okay, it was just a lucky guess on my part. Uh, and um, uh, switching, therefore, from cluster B to cluster A. Uh, the third cluster A personality disorder happens to be the paranoid personality disorder, that which is defined through a pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of others. Um, I think more importantly for us, and it's more of a clinical crawl, um, although one you'll certainly see in a case fit, yeah, but I don't think it'll be too difficult to uh, identify it. And that is how behaviors like this, eccentricities, can result in clinically significant distress or impairment in, in this case, Kramer or others, including Susan and her family, uh, and, ter uh, and certainly in terms of the outcome of their cabin. So, um, and we could probably create a, a nice discussion on Kramer himself, not necessarily, well, of course, incorporating those aspects and traits of the cluster A personality disorders, but also, and again, clinically, perhaps more importantly, um, the actual suffering that it causes, the, ac the actual clinical significance in each of these episodes, and we see it here, and that's exactly, I think, what you identified here. Any other thoughts about Kramer? And what questions do we have about any of the cluster A personalities? I do have a question about cluster A personality disorder. So I think um, one of the biggest things about psychiatry is there needs to be, like you were saying, kind of like a clinical significance to it. Like it has to affect them. I feel like some of the personality disorders, I can see how maybe it would not quite, or it, like for example, schizoid, <laughs> um, the patient might be content. And, the, you know, it's kind of hard to say that, um, you need to have friends or you need to have people around you for, to have like a, 
quote normal or like good or or um, life. So I guess kind of what's like the line where you have someone who's schizoid personality disorder. This is a diagnosis. This is you know kind of labeling it something, calling it like in a way pathological. Um, at what point do you kind of just accept that some people are just going to live their lives a little bit in isolation and that's how they are? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think in starting out, we would always accept that a person can live their life out the way they choose. Um, but in terms of psychiatry, individuals will often present us with a chief complaint uh, and or present through a third party, whether it be uh, the criminal justice system, whether it be the Board of Health, et cetera. Um, because individuals who have schizoid personality are by definition content on your shelf, these individuals are much, much, much more likely to present through a third party. And even though the person may say, I'm fine, and be telling you the truth, are reliable, the larger scope paints a picture where it is not fine because the Board of Health is telling you they're gonna be evicted, right? So clinical significance will always be that line, sell for others and self-report or collateral, collateral Board of Health, law enforcement, et cetera. Right, so that's that, that's the way to approach it. And um, the way this often comes up on an exam is, um, again, third party referral and someone who is content and being able to distinguish their behavior, probably labeled schizoid personality disorder from the avoidant personality. Right, because individuals who avoid present similar to, um, although they're more likely to be the self referral. Right, because they are conflicted because they do want to be out there. They just feel inhibited of putting themselves out there. Did, did that address or answer your question? Yeah. And one more thing is um, how do you go about like do you disclose this diagnosis? I feel like personalizers are kind of difficult diagnosis to disclose to the patient sometimes because <laughs> I it, it is true, it should they shouldn't be though. Uh, personality disorder should be looked upon as any disorder, which means that they, with regard to healthcare equity, should be looked upon as any illness, period. Mm -hmm. So if you are uh, prohibited, if you feel um, concerned about discussing a personality disorder with a patient, that might be okay as long as you agree that you should feel just as inhibited as uh, discussing someone's heart disease or cancer which of course, if you're wearing a white coat, would seem preposterous, right? So uh, healthcare equity, mental illness equal physical equals physical illness. And within mental illness, all mental illnesses should be approached um, the same. And that is if they are resulting in clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning, it must be addressed. Yep. But that said, there uh, there's a hidden curriculum where even a lot of practitioners, a lot of psychiatrists certainly um, behave in the way in which you just described. There's no doubt about that. And I know and I know what the next thought that pops in, or perhaps the thought that even resulted in your asking the question, and that is, well, doesn't that diagnosis then kind of follow a person around? Yes, so does leukemia. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying that what we're identifying exists is no different than any other illness, including physical illness. Any questions about Kramer? Ideas, thoughts? And by, way, by the way, another great parallel, kind of just to bring this together. Imagine if Kramer were a psychiatrist. I mean, mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, there'd be some issues, right? H however, one issue that would not be there is that his feeling inhibited in discussing people's problems with them, right? He would not be, a, this is not someone who would be in that group that would almost feel ashamed of saying, I believe you're afflicted with a condition called schizoid personality or borderline personality. What are the characters you want to discuss this morning? Happy the bubble boy. The bubble boy. I think his name was Donald. Okay. Um, he's, I mean, obviously he lives a very isolated life, both physically and it also seems emotionally as well, um, because there doesn't seem to be much interaction between uh, his parents and himself and, and, him, and him with like the rest of society. I think the component of that and it's kind of evidence in his behaviors is that he becomes, he has like an air of like self-righteousness where he's like, I am right, right, I'm correct. And like, especially when they're playing the game, like I'm correct in this game, I know the answer. Um, and then to me, that kind of lends a little bit like, narciss like narcissistic personality disorder. 
um, because he he wants to be this. He, he is a center of attention in, in the town, especially uh, as evidenced by all the townspeople kind of knowing who he is, knowing that you know he was attacked, quote unquote. Um, but it it seems like he may be ex experiencing some some components of narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, and then also on top of that, there may be some episodes of like aggression and like agitated behavior that may resemble like intermittent explosive disorder as well, uh, especially when he got so upset over the uh, fact that the answer card was incorrectly spelled and George is not giving him credit for the for the point. Yep, that's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Uh, I think you brought up a lot of points that we could go in a lot of directions with this. Uh, so uh, when somebody presents, um, we'll call that someone Donald, uh, with uh, signs and symptoms that you just identified, um, what is the first thing which should pop in your head within seconds of sitting across a desk from Donald, um, assuming that you know there's the proper barrier up, everybody's safe? What stance, what's always your, always your starting point when talking to a patient. It's that whatever they're presenting, whatever the chief complaint is, is within the, is within the realm of normal, yeah. right? And again, I don't care if you have to move off that point within seconds, I want your brain to always be set to that point, okay? Do, do we know uh, Donald's age? Uh, somebody just quick search, how old is Donald the bubble boy? I don't you know, maybe there's something on Reddit. I don't think it does. It's, I think it adolescence, it's like 10 to 11, all the way up to like early teens okay. or late teens. The voice sounds like <laughs> yeah. It sounded like he was in his you know, 20s, maybe. Yeah, I was shocked. yeah, yeah. Because even like it, yeah, I don't know, just this whole demeanor. I was like, this is, I was expecting like an innocent kid, and then you get what he is, and it's like in such sharp contrast to. That narrative that's created. So, uh, you know, within, within that framework of how we are going to approach a clinical situation with unconditional positive regard, again, borrowing from Rogers, um, is this idea of healthy narcissism, right? We all were at a particular age where we understood that the entire universe, the solar system, does revolve around us, right? Um, and how did we learn that? How in the world would we have arrived at that conclusion? Like based on kind of like, I guess like attachment type. Exactly. Like and and who's who's probably the one who's who established that attachment? Here. Yeah, more times than that, it's gonna be mom. I mean, listen, we blame mom for everything wrong. Let's blame her for something right here, right? That That is when we were two or three, life was perfect because the world did revolve around us. Thank you, mom. So thank your mothers today when you go home. Now, at some point that changes, right? That belief that the world revolves around you when developmentally appropriate um, goes by several different names. One is healthy childhood narcissism. Um, and that's COHA. That's you know, uh, stage theorists, developmental theorists. Until we're told, hey, the world does not revolve around you, probably also likely being verbalized by mom. At that point, the child begins to develop a sense of empathy. The idea that the, there are more people in this world other than me, and I have to begin to appreciate their perspective. Right? It's the development of empathy. And then empathy becomes a necessary building block for compassion, compassion towards others. And when that development derails, things can turn pathological, the most severe of which is called the narcissistic personality disorder. Right, So a, a very quick, over, overly simplistic primer on the development of narcissism, which starts out healthy in all of us. Uh, but then ultimately for most of us, develops into aspects of empathy and even compassion. What might derail that natural development? Why would a person who starts out narcissistic like, like any of us were two, three, four, 
stay narcissistic or stay egocentric. That's the real psychological term here. They're like constantly, if they never are able to move beyond this state where they depend on, you know, their caretaker or they're never able to interact with other people their age who are always also progressing through that. And, and what might result in their not being able to have those types of social experiences? Uh, they might kind of stay at that earlier age. Why? Give me an example. Trauma. Right. We'll call all of the above trauma. Again, it, it could be emotional, it could be physical, it could be sexual, it could be all of the above. It could be sub threshold. Right? But there's something that derails the quote unquote normal development. I don't think with this idea, I don't think it's that hard now to understand why Donald is presenting narcissistic like. Now, um, I don't know. I don't think we've seen enough of this where we can say, well, he was remaining egocentric, which is just a clinical descriptor. Um, or, and again, we're talking about age inappropriate egocentrism, or whether or not he's at the other end of that spectrum where he has a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. Again, per Kohut, the most severe form. I think, I think Kohut theorized this comes in four stages. One, uh, right. So once once one derails from healthy infantile or ch or childhood narcissism, there's four stages. The fourth and final stage, the most severe, is the actual personality disorder. So, um, and I don't know. I don't know where we are with this, uh, but I think we do understand that it is age inappropriate. So it's definitely developmentally inappropriate, uh, and uh, may in fact that is query. Uh, the narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. As far as how we develop our defense mechanisms, I would imagine this also probably starts around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so with the bubble boy, he acts out quite a lot when he doesn't get his way. Um, do you also connect that to the fact that he's not progressing through what we also don't know how old he is so it makes it difficult to sort of determine where he is in this in this uh pathway but his acting out when he doesn't get his way could that be related to the fact that he's also hasn't developed healthy coping mechanisms oh yeah because he's not mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and the way i would frame this again is um when we when we kind of now fold in the idea of defense mechanisms is you know what may have predisposed to what we're observing as now um, uh, adolescent behavior, uh, what precipitates it, and then what are the perpetuating factors. And at each stage of those three Ps, we have biopsychosocial factors that can figure in. Among the psychological factors are the defense mechanisms. And I think it's fairly easy to see that these psychological factors called defense mechanisms are perpetuating the behavior. Uh, so he's not able to break the cycle, largely due to his maladaptive use of acting out. So again, the three Ps merging with the biopsychosocial case approach. I think too, like also his parents are obviously like a big kind of perpetuating factor. I mean, I think obviously it's out of like compassion for him because they recognize that he has like a lot of limited ability to interact with the outside world or to even kind of engage in normal like youthful activities, but just by the way that, like, when they walked in the house and was like, mom, can I get some, like, up here, you know, she was very much, like, she also, like, enabled that behavior, because she responded to it, which reinforced that, like, in his mind, that's okay, that he can get that reward if he continues to kind of act out in that way. Right, um, so where we identify defense mechanisms as psychological factors that perpetuate the behavior, now we're identifying social factors, so we're really shaping a, a biopsychosocial a perspective on what is perpetuating the bubble boy's quote unquote narcissistic behavior. And you used a big word reinforcement here. So within those, re uh, excuse me, perpetuating factors, specifically the social factors of what we're observing from the parents, um, we have now elements of behavioral psychology, including reinforcement. So a little bit of a tangent here, 
somebody tell me the difference between operant conditioning versus classical conditioning because you brought it up and it can in fact appear on shelf exams. The classical is when you um, associate like an unconscious stimuli with the unconditioned ready and slip. Yeah, with um, with like an unconscious response. Um, so it's, it's like the classic example is like Pavlov's dog. So the bell and the um, the bell is like the stimulus, and then um, salivating is like an unconscious response. Um, unconditioned. Sorry, unconditioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that's exactly right. So again, learning by association. By the way, on a shelf exam, the common way this presents is an individual who has undergone cancer chemotherapy and months later went in remission, drives to the parking lot of the hospital and becomes nauseous, right? So again, the response is an associative response. It's a Pavlovian response. It is a response that is classically conditioned. It's a very common test question. And that differs from operant conditioning how? Operant conditioning is is more of like a like a positive um, versus negative reinforcement. So you kind of pair um, certain like certain um, Behavior. yeah behaviors um, and positive, which is like commonly confusing. And positive is you're actually giving something. So that could like uh, I think pain is technically considered positive because you're like giving something. Um, in addition, kind of, and a negative is taking something away. So, like taking away a reward. Um, yeah. Yep. Everybody, everybody got that, right? Mm -hmm. So, let, let's review this again. Uh, and again, correct. Um, whereas classical conditioning is learning through association, operant, condition, uh, operant conditioning uh, is learning by consequences. It's consequential learning, it's Skinnerian learning. Um, when you get a Test question. When you get a question on your shelf with the four answers, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, approach it in a two-step way. Step number one, you have to ask yourself, is the behavior strengthened or weakened? So read that case vignette with that single question in mind. If the behavior in question is strengthened, it can only be reinforcement. So you cross any punishment answer off your list of four. Once you um, ask that question, then the second question is exactly what you addressed. And that is, is something added to the equation or removed? If it's added, it's positive. It's, if it's removed, it's negative. If you just stick to that two-pronged approach, you'll never get a question on operant conditioning incorrect. Is behavior strengthened or weakened? Strengthened equals reinforcement. Weakened equals punishment. And number two, is something added or removed to induce that response? Okay. Let's talk about, and not that we actually have issues pertaining to alcohol in this particular episode, but let's talk about disulfiram uh, because it appears on exams very, very often. What is disulfiram? Like a basically drug that can interfere with like enzymatic, I guess, like metabolism of alcohol. So it like produces symptoms of like a hangover to like an extreme effect. Right. And what enzyme? Very. Okay. Acid aldehyde dehydrogenase will be answer C or D. Alcohol dehydrogenase will be answer A or B. People who write test questions like myself love tricking students who are very tense, very anxious, and read questions too fast. And of course, read through the answers too fast. It's acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, and we will never put that as answer A or B. Right? So please read those questions, or excuse me, the answers very, very closely. Uh, and it, you're right, that is an enzyme that catalyzes the rate limiting step of alcohol breakdown. Uh, what results is a buildup of aldehyde which is toxic. What happens when you have excess aldehyde in your bloodstream? What's the toxicity? Uh, what actually happens when aldehyde builds in the bloodstream? You get flushed. Um, Nauseous, being flushed. Exactly right. Diaphoresis, you get faint. You get pre-syncopal. 
Uh, that is called the uh, disulfiram reaction. Disulfiram being the um, the brand name of, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, the generic of antifuse, which is the brand name. What type of learning? So the idea is, is that prescribing this medication called branded disulfiram results is a part of a biopsychosocial approach. It's the bio of maintaining abstinence in someone who is afflicted with alcohol use disorder. What type of learning does this take advantage of? Louder? Operant. Op operant conditioning would be correct. Unfortunately, it's not going to be an answer in your set. Positive, Positive punishment. You want to weaken the behavior and you're adding something. Perfect. All right. Uh, I will tell you that a lot of medical students say it's negative reinforcement, which is the complete opposite. Right. But if you just break down the question with those two steps, you can't get it wrong. Right. Any other observations, thoughts on Donald or any other characters in the bubble book? I'm interested in his interaction with Joy because he also kind of helps. He 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 also has has some um, kind of features that that makes his interactions with Dabo um, more more difficult than they need to be. So like we're we're talking about you know like possible reasons why Dabo may have narcissistic features, but George also shows similar features, and you don't really have an explanation why why he would. But you know the the insistence that you know. Morris is incorrect because the card says me. It's kind of absurd on its on its face. Like especially considering the whole reason why he came there in the first place was, you know, in a sense to try to comfort or bring some joy to to this to this boy. And then also like when they first came into the house, George starts speaking up like, oh yeah, I have like lots of bubbles in my family, like my cousin and all that. Or, you know. Unclear reason why he was surprised about having, you know, immunocompromised family members, but. Yeah, I completely agree. So I, I don't think many of us would have significant concerns identifying that George, um, while he might not might not meet the full diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder per se, certainly is egocentric. I, I think that that's certainly something we could agree on. Um, and of course, egocentrism at this age, again, age and appropriate egocentrism certainly provides and um, uh, imparts increased risk for developing uh, a narcissistic personality. It's no, there's no doubt about that. So, uh, and then we so and we see these two figures clash, which we would expect when two narcissists actually begin to talk to one another. And this also gets, and we'll kind of end here with the root of this clinical term, this diagnosis, and where do we get the idea or the wording, the title of this disorder? Who is Narcissus? It was uh, like a, I don't know, like what his actual job was, or is it, is it the Greek, the Greek like folklore where an individual who uh, basically was like in love with himself um, and loved the way he looked, which causes like significant dis disruption in, in his personal life uh, with the, I think the woman he loved as well. I forgot the exact details of the story. Yeah. So um, so what happens is, is that this whole story actually starts with the story of Echo, right? Who's a maiden who has got the gift of gap. Um, when she gets your attention, time just seems to melt away because of the way she's able to talk. And this gift is abused by Zeus, who makes sure that it, when he's on his different escapades with other women, he introduces Echo to his wife, Hera, so that Hera is has a, her attention impaired, right? Um, unfortunately for, for Echo, Hera becomes aware of what Zeus is up to, and the fact that he's the king of the gods prevents him from any kind of um, retaliation. So this is called displacement in psychiatry, where Hera's anger is going to be displaced and cathexed towards the person that she could harm, and that's unfortunately Echo. So what happens is that her gift becomes her curse, and she's not able to talk anymore. The only word she's able to say 
is the final word someone who speaks to her. She stumbles upon Narcissus and falls instantly in love. Unfortunately, she can't express her feelings. So ultimately she is shunned by this huntsman. The gods of Olympus take note and curse him with the same type of outcome saying that the next person you meet, you will actually experience unrequited love. And the next person he meets is himself through a reflection in the water in the riverbed. Uh, he's unable to pull himself away. He falls so deeply in love, his feet actually take root. And just before he expires his final breath, the gods of Olympus take pity on him and turn him into the Narcissus, which is a flower that continues to grow on the muddy beds of rivers. Right? So we capture that essence. Uh, um, and it, it gets to the idea of narcissism in that individuals with individuals with this individual, excuse me, with this condition, and this includes egocentrism, who don't have things reflected back draw the conclusion, therefore, they don't exist. So my only self-worth is that which is reflected back to me, very consistent with the myth. If it's not reflected back, it doesn't exist. What's kind of interesting in this particular episode, and we're discussing the bubble boy, is that Larry David nails this because there's this, there's this bubble, there's this plastic in front of George, and he sees something reflected back to him through that plastic. And it happens to be Donald, happens to be a younger version of himself. Do you think that's why also we never fully see him? Like in all the, cause like that was kind of unsettling for me as like a viewer, the way like the camera, like it was filmed, like we never see Donald. We just see like a hand that's coming out of like plastic sheet. We'd have to ask Larry David. So somebody tag him on Twitter and we'll, we'll get this answer. I don't know if this was inadvertent. I don't know if this was actually something discussed um, in, in, a, in a back conference room in terms of uh, writing up this script, but it is interesting that George is staring in or staring at a piece of plastic and sees something reflected back that reminds him of a younger version of himself, whether he's actually seeing his true reflection or whether it's Donald or whether Donald even exists. I suggest he probably does since there, there are parents there and we've seen George travel so far to to meet him. So we'll end here. The other thing I want to mention too is that we have another story of unrequited love at 12 o'clock, ironically. Someone else who was hit by Eros's arrow uh, and will not have that love returned to her. And we'll see some probably clinically significant outcomes in the story titled Misery. So that's at 12 o'clock and that's an Instagram live. Thank you.